There's a very good reason for us hosting this discussion today, and this is because the for the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, youth has always been a topic which has been uh, very important, but recently even more so, because it's climbing to the top of agendas, the, the debate on, on, on youth and how to address youth in agriculture, simply because when we think about the future of food and even more generally the future of rural spaces, there is a bit of a worry when we see the trend of youth not getting involved in agriculture or also moving into the urban spaces. But today, the paradigm of this discussion is going to shift this a little bit, I believe, because as much as I've spoken with the, the presenters, it's become clear that this paradigm that we speak about, we speak about the youth, the youth as our future farmers, we speak about the youth as the future of food, this is in part the reason for their disinterest in agriculture. And this is shockingly or ironically because the narrative of farming is not an attractive one. So this has been said many times before, there is a big need for a refresh on how to approach the topic of youth in agriculture. And I think especially for donors who have rural transformation very much on their minds, Agenda 2030. So I wanted to start just very quickly already with PAPE. PAPE is coming from the Global Youth Innovations Network. It is a massive network. Some of you on the line are already involved with PAPE and he was uh, in our, uh, we came to know of him from the Commission on World Food Security. Last year, Pape, you took part in a youth incubator. Uh, I just wanted to start off very quickly by asking you to present yourself a little bit about the Global Youth Innovation Network, and then we can talk more critically about the four or five key things you already shared with me that you feel like donors should or must know about the youth in agriculture, particularly interventions around mentorship, entrepreneurship, and others. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So, yes, uh, the Global Youth Innovation Network is a, a network of youth-inspired and youth-led network of young entrepreneurs, uh, micro, rural micro enterprise who are committed to act as a hunger fighter, change agent, and innovators. And uh, it's, just, it's an approach that we use uh, at a grassroots level where young people themselves try to identify their own problems and try to suggest solutions. And we invite uh, government, non-profit organizations, for-profit organizations, as well as uh, international institutions to treat youth as equal uh, change agents, uh, equal partners, change agents, and also co-creators of uh, programs, policies, and, and so on. Uh, but the whole idea is to make sure that at least we impact their livelihood their learning, and their life purpose. And what we mean by that is, how do we get young people, both in the rural and the urban area, but especially uh, young people in the urban area, to be part of uh, the solution to their own problems as you know, for the farmers. And uh, that's something that we've been doing uh, for now six years. And uh, the network, like I said, has what we call as the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs. But... Uh, the main challenge is that we're facing here is mostly with rural youth, young people under it. And the, one of the main problems is, first, it's really difficult, you know, to get youth to be involved in activities, rural youth. And it's not that they don't want to be involved, it's just they cannot afford not to, you know, uh, not to work. And what I mean by that is they have to provide food on the table when you ask them to come for a training. Even if we're paying for the training for everything, they always want to be able to have something to live at home uh, to provide food for their families. Uh, second, uh, transportation and communication in terms of uh, having access to the market is really difficult for them. Uh, so what we have been doing is uh, let's use those young people and leverage the local community assets and see what already exists on the ground, meaning what already exists in their respective communities, and try to understand if there is any knowledge gap, if anything has been done there or anything has been achieved, what was the challenges and uh, what was uh, the solution. And from there, we also developed three training curriculum based on agribusiness and agri entrepreneurs, where themselves will train them as facilitators so they can train their own youth, so meaning training trainers, and they become their own trainers. And then from there, they um, become... Uh, uh, 
from facilitators that become mentors to supporters. So it's from 15 years old to 35 years old, and we do that with different institutions. And the third thing that we do is we try to connect them with finances. That also has been really challenging because a lot of institutions, the microfinance institutions that we reach out to, they have finances. So money is really available to you, to you, but it's not accessible to you, as you all know. Uh, why? Because, you know, collateral guarantee, all the things that we're already talking about. If the banks are saying, how can you, as a network, minimize our risk and increase the likelihood of the youth for being successful? So meaning that if we can provide to them um, a guarantee capital, a little bit of money where they can minimize risk, of their investment, instead of investing 100%, they'll invest maybe 70%, 80%, so it depends on the guarantee capital that we can provide, so that will be helpful to the bank. The second one is how can we also coach the young people to increase the likelihood of their success? Coaching meaning incubate, incubation, meaning acceleration, meaning training, meaning supporting, meaning providing them with resources, with knowledge, with talent. So because of those three things that we learned, the knowledge gap, the experimental training uh, program where it's based on entrepreneurship of their venture and also the access. Now we're focusing mostly on on developing a a platform, which is a physical and online platform we call the Global Youth Business Incubator, where young people can have access to all those services using what we call the national implementing partners. The national implementing partners, these are partners, local organizations, universities, and government agencies, where they will take um, the knowledge from the the knowledge gap survey or study that we've done on the ground with the young people to understand what works, what, what didn't work, and using that with the global partners that we have, like big uh, universities and other organizations, to develop a curriculum, a training curriculum that's based on the specific need of the community, that's based on the specific need of the young people. So that's why you go through the pro- program with an idea or with a project based on the venture of your choice, and then it's a practical training where you go, find if you have the plan, find if you have the support, find you have the knowledge, you have the mentor, and you graduate with a business, not necessarily with an idea of a certificate. So this big challenge, of course, is uh, the money aspect in terms of how do you leverage guarantee capital to be able to reduce the risk of the bank to be able to, to leverage money from the bank so they can fund those young people once they finish the training, once they fund the coaching. We have, we have the support and we've been doing it in several countries. We have a strong focus in Africa, but uh, right now we are uh, pretty much in uh, uh, 88 countries, mostly in uh, 59 where we have chapter 29 where we have operation, meaning working with other people. So just to wrap up, uh, what I will say that what we really learn is, you know, young people, if given the support and if even traded as equal partners where they identify their own problems, and suggest their own solution, and adults and partners can come with the expertise and the resources. The uh, problem, most of the problem, can be solved, and we have a lot of success stories, cases that we can share around this year. But Papa, it seems that you're able to do quite a number of things: training, mentorship, um, going all the way uh, into their graduation, and, and uh, then how they can run their business. But I'm only wondering if you've had um, donor support. I suppose so. And um, how does that come up? And how can you continue to, or how would you continue to ask donors to to focus a little bit more on youth issues based on this experience of yours, based on the experience that you've explained? Um, Where would you tell donors, okay, this is where we need your, your support? I think it will definitely uh, mobilizing uh, um, the guarantee capital. That will be pretty much where we will focus on the absolute donor. Because, like I said, we have uh, our, our challenge is not finding partners. We have a lot of consortiums that we work with, like big American university, European and African universities. We have a lot of government agencies that we're working with. We do a lot of work uh, with IFAD, as you know, and FAO and so on, CTA. So that, but when we really have problems is after coaching and supporting you for a year, for three years, planning them, helping them develop their business plan, taking them through the coaching, the incubation process. When we get to the bank and the bank said, okay, we know you're doing all these things. We know that they're very good. We know they're ready, but we are a business. If we don't have guaranteed capital, we won't be able to give it to you because we always also require this bank to reduce their interest rate 
at maximum 10%, which you know in Africa and most developing countries is really difficult. It goes up to 20 something percent. So, uh, what I will really uh, ask for support from the donors is to help set up a guarantee capital for rural youth, for youth in general who want to start their businesses and already gone through a training program, they already gone through a, a incubation and support. Uh, program where they already have local partners coaching them, supporting them, where they already develop a, 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 their access to the market and figure out transportation to get to the market. So now it's just getting a startup or a scale of capital. That's the problem. Banks are willing to really help out, but they're not willing to lower the interest if they don't have any guarantee capital. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pate. So the audience we have today is full of donors, all of whom are very keen on, on tackling this issue of youth in agriculture. And uh, given what you've said and you've highlighted uh, from what I've heard three to four things, uh, you said guarantee capital. This comes up at several events that I've attended on youth, including at CADEP, Africa level, uh, what you've said. So it seems that generally it's a global issue for youth who are trying to get involved in agriculture. Hello, Trang. I was saying if you could please start us off, tell us a little bit about Far Green, a little sure. bit about you as a young uh, person, uh, you are an agricultural mm -hmm. entrepreneur, and you can also then carry yeah. on to tell us a few of the challenges that you have gone through as a young person in agribusiness and some of the main messages that you wanted to pass on to donors and you've already been doing so in some of the other arenas such as CFS and such as with colleagues from GIZ and others. Please go ahead, the floor is yours. Uh, oh, sure, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone from Vietnam. My name is Jiang Shen, uh, and I started Far Green. Um, officially, I started it two years ago, where after I graduated, after I finished my MBA program uh, from Colorado State University in the US. So I returned home and, um, and started the um, so we had like one year of doing piloting and, um, and now we're officially running and um, having our product out in the market. So we, uh, so we are social enterprise. Um, we work, we work uh, with the purpose of building green, um, a prosperous green farming communities. Uh, what we do is that uh, we create sustainable business models that help farmers eliminate environmentally damaging practices like the open burning of the straw, which is very common in rice-producing countries like Vietnam, um, and, and at the same time help these farmers earn additional income while staying with their land. Um, so uh, our first product online uh, is uh, the premium edible mushroom that, um, that we produce um, uh, with the inspiration from the cradle to cradle approach, in which we we build a, a closed loop business model, which we use a rice straw, uh, the leftover after the rice harvesting, as the only substrate to grow mushroom, and then the leftover after the mushroom cultivation, this we um, get uh, we return back to the land as by fertilizer for other crops at as in rice and vegetable. Um, so currently, we, what we do with the uh, with the farmers that we create a network of them that's staying at at home, and we'll give them um, training on how to produce mushroom and um, and invest in them with the um, the green the greenhouse that they can produce um, and take care of the mushroom at at their their home. For the challenges in starting this, um, I can. And I can go on and on talk about this forever, but I, I would say there are two parts in um in all the challenges that um I'm facing when I'm you know, when I'm running this. There's a there's a business part as you know, it's really hard to start a business. Um to see you young and you know, just like whole sets of um challenges that you face when you start any kind of business, like um, you know, finding funding and getting mentorship, getting all the um, recruiting people when starting a business. And, you know, starting our, our, our cultural business is even harder because our culture is actually um, it's just, it's, it's a really a challenging area um, because, as you pointed out, as Jody 
pointed out earlier, not many people are, um, you know, interested in agriculture nowadays, especially young people. They um, want to work uh, for, you know, other, you know, high tech, like like some of the hot um, trends in, in the industry, like high tech. Or, um, so, so that's really a challenge. That's a, that's a great challenge in recruiting talents. And also agricultural, especially in countries like in in emerging um, economies like like Vietnam, and I'm sure in, in many developing countries, it's um, it's highly affected by climate change. So uh, it's a risky business because we depend a lot on the weather, and um, and so so what we uh, so what we're working on is really like. We call like triple, even triple bottom line um, business. So we're dealing with the uh, with the planet, and we're helping the the people, and we're bringing the food. So those are the challenges that, that I'm facing. Just very quickly to pick up on two things that you spoke about, which which um, I think come up quite often. Mentorship. Mm-hmm. You spoke about mentorship, um, mm-hmm. but you also spoke about entrepreneurship. And I think right. what's key with you is that you are looking at agriculture as a, a business, as as an entrepreneurial opportunity, which is something um, uh, that felt it might have not, uh, that paradigm has not yet been fully addressed by donors in the sense that we're right. still looking at the young people as, as farmers and uh, the future of food. So right. in, a, in a big sense, it seems to lack this attractive language of you're a business person, you're an entrepreneur. Uh, did right. that have anything to play uh, uh, into, uh, let's say, when you went into agriculture? Did you get the feeling mm-hmm. you're not going to be a farmer, you're not going to be the future of food, you want to run a business? Was that the reason or the pulling for you to go into agriculture? No, it's not really. I mean, I love agriculture. I, I would, you know, like I was born surrounding by farms, and and the reason why I started the business is because I want to help these uh, um, farmers' lives and also the environment at the same time. And I have um, also it's because of my passion for food and and like getting in into this areas, I could see that um, a lot of these. Um, donors and um, and and the development programs is um, focusing on on the farmers and 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 just like um, maybe not completing um, the full way of helping them, but it, you know just part of it. For example, to just just like training them, but but and then not connecting them to the market, or somebody's just connecting them to the market, but then like let them to thrive. Not every farmers are entrepreneurs, unfortunately. So they, they, you know, the, the farmers are great at producing food, but in order to survive, uh, they need to to be very connected to the market, to learn about the demand, to learn about the new trend in food. Like for example, now people really care about, um, you know, the healthy food, like. Where your food come from? So, you know, so the farmer need so so that what I I see the gap there. Like I see that there's a need of somebody that could be the connection between the farmer and the and the market, and and you know actually bringing the farmer together, like you know as a like building the network. That's not just a mediator, but like really having them. Um, in the supply chain. Thanks, Trang. Karen has joined us. You're here to now emphasize a little bit on the innovations uh, and technical applications in agriculture, because we've just heard from from Pape, who's been telling us really critical things that, uh, as a youth innovation network, they've been they've been working on, but also where they find there are some sticky areas that they still need some support, and uh, where donors should sort of think of, of, of um, intervening, and they mentioned guarantee capital, mentoring, coaching, and support of the youth, um, and now I wanted to just come to you because you're coming in with the technology aspect. We know youth are tech savvy, 
and uh, you've been working very hard to connect youth to the newest applications using ICT in the Caribbean region. So could you kindly come in, tell us a little bit about what you do, and then you can also tell us about some of the challenges that, that you are experiencing and some key messages you would have from donors from your experience working with youth. What I do very quickly is that I produce social video for agriculture. I utilize mobile journalism. This is the use of mobile devices, accessories, and applications in order to gather, edit, and produce content. It is part of new a new age form of journalism, and it is fast becoming a common practice in media houses and amongst freelancers and and persons who are producing news. The way that our information is presented has now changed. So this is what the the media news outlets are keeping up with. So basically Tech Fangry is trying to turn this this trend into a business for agriculture. And so that means we go out into the field often, we meet other people, we and we meet entrepreneurs. And something that we've come across is that persons are very innovative, they're very creative. It is one of the main topics of our of our series and what we do, whereby people figure out ways, they, they invent things, they come up with different methods and different ways of doing something, whether they in create a new invention or whether they create a new process. And we find that a lot of these, these young persons do not have the type of support that they need. And it would be similar to what Papi has already mentioned in terms of mentoring support, because it's not to say uh, these, these young persons are building businesses from scratch or to say in a, in a traditional sense. Whatever they are doing is very different and it's very new. And therefore, they may not have a particular benchmark to fall back upon or, you know, any kind of example of, of which they can follow in order to improve their business. So in that sense, mentoring would be something that is extremely important and something that we don't have any opportunities for in the agriculture sphere particularly in the Caribbean region. It's, be, it's very competitive for, for whatever odd reason. It's very competitive in, the, in terms of young persons who are coming up in the agriculture sector. You're almost left to your own devices, in a sense, to try to figure out how do you build your own business. And when it comes to businesses that are very unique, it's, it's a very difficult um, situation. Okay, yeah, so thank you. And um, the message is clear that whether you're in the Caribbean, you're in Vietnam, you're in Senegal, um, youth are sort of facing the same issues. I suppose the word business has come up between uh, all of you, and I just wanted to open up the conversation now a little bit more. Uh, we have quite a few people online, and... Um, Many of them are working with, with youth, and they can at least enlighten us a little bit on, on how they have been approaching this topic or this subject, and uh, a little bit about even the issues that you've talked about, about mentorship, about uh, guarantee capital. And just to ask some of the donors or the partners online what you have heard that, let's say, has struck you, which is different to the sort of narrative that you've been working with uh, normally, and if you have any feedback to what they have said that they need most from donors. This is Boris speaking from the GIZ Sector Program for Rural Development. First of all, I would like to thank the three presenters for their really inspiring and impressing uh, descriptions of the work they're doing. And, and I would like to... Uh, to rather have a question to, to those presenters who, who come from the youth perspective. And um, what, what strikes me is that there is a lot of entrepreneurial uh, dynamics among the youth in rural and urban areas in developing countries. I would like to shed a bit the focus on the African continent where we, we are focusing a problem that's 
more than 20 million people annually are entering the labor market. And agriculture is the mainstay of economic development. So still we have an issue that uh, not every youth, not every of these 20 million can become an entrepreneur. So, but working in agriculture is something that uh, turns off quite a lot of young people. This is actually when you read through documents, uh, what you what you come across all the time. So, so my question is rather from from the perspective, what would the youth need? What incentives would the youth need to get more engaged in agriculture in a broader sense? Not only opening up uh, very nice entrepreneurial businesses, but also to get involved in agricultural production as such. So which incentives are needed? Is it is it something that can be solved by donors? Is it something that can be solved by by organizing young people in the rural area in the agricultural sector, or is it something that needs to be addressed uh, in, in in a big broader way, like also looking at the educational sector and and raising the image of agriculture as a as a potential area of employment for young people? How, how do you see that? particularly our our young entrepreneurs okay i i would like to answer i do agree with you there are there are different ways there are different incentives that donors can provide not just from a financial perspective but from position of resources or support so for example um there is very, very little money in terms of agricultural investment. The the donor, the donor, um, the list of donor stakeholders here in the Caribbean is is not very long in terms of direct agricultural support. But some of them in the past have provided support in terms of providing an office space, you know, and absorbing whatever small costs may come out of that office or even providing, which is like what Tech for Agri does, which is providing moral support in terms of needing, you know, just having somebody that has your back. So, for example, our series, we cannot get financial support from the Young Professionals for Agriculture Research and Development, which is called YPAR for short. It's a global network. We cannot get financial support, but they do have a very powerful network of young persons out there. So a simple thing as sharing our episodes with that network is very, very supportive for us here in Caribbean because we can then say, look, we have the support of this huge global network. Will you now support us as in another donor or some sort of um, investor or something to that effect? It just provides that moral support. So, to me, those are some of the things that donors could do in terms of tax creating or tax or uh, building upon incentives apart from finance in terms of um, supporting young people in agriculture. Hi, Papa. Please go ahead. I think he asked a really, really, really good question. Um, how do you? I deal pretty much with the 20 million people who are entering the labor market every day. I think the problem needs to be addressed in a really broader way, like you said, which is the second option. Uh, because one, most youth in developing countries are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs by default. What I mean by default is they are just trying to survive, like survival entrepreneurship. So that's really what's happening. But in order to really address this, especially those people in agriculture, because, you know, agriculture is the biggest opportunity in this developing country, uh, and especially in Africa, where you have a lot of youth who are not doing much, and you have a lot of land as well. But the challenge, as you said, is they don't want to do it the same way their parents would wanna, uh, have been doing it, have been doing it, or their grandparents have been doing it. And... The fact of we really thinking about, you know, bringing youth to agriculture, I think really that's the wrong, wrong approach. I think what we really should do is bring agriculture to youth. And what I mean by that is, how do we make it easier? For example, instead of going there and asking young farmers and, and saying, okay, what do you need? How can we help you scale up this 
they don't really they want to solve it, but they don't have the options. They don't have the options because they haven't seen something that's totally different. They haven't traveled. So I think bringing the experts one and having them listen to the youth, that's another way of helping them. And then second, how do you make sure that we mechanize agriculture in a way that the costs are bearable to the small farmers? Instead of uh, asking them to pay for a tractor, we can ask maybe a whole collective of young Armstrong to share the cost of a tractor or use it on just per, uh, on a per need basis where they just need it and they will pay it. So like uh, uh, there is companies that are already doing that that we work with, uh, like the Hubo of the of, of tractor. That one. But another aspect that I think you really mentioned, which is you know going through education at the border. How do you bring in urban youth or youth who are in education, the educational system, who are students in agriculture, pair them with rural youth who are already in the farm, they are doing work in a they are farming in a really traditional way, and bringing youth in an urban idea. Pairing them or creating a, a co-founder system where they'll start a business together, where the urban youth will be able to learn from the rural youth and see the opportunities that exist in the rural youth that he didn't know about. And also have the rural youth work with the urban youth where they will bring in technology into agriculture, which make it easier, which make it more accessible for the rural youth, and will make it more attractive and sexier the way that we want to perceive agriculture for them so they can get into agriculture. I think there is a really holistic system that brings in uh, urban youth to the game, that bringing educational system, especially agricultural educational system, and systems into the game, that bringing farmers and and um, mentors into, into the game, where they will have youth take the lead in terms of speaking and sharing their needs, where adults and experts will listen and then develop that co-founder uh, co-founder relationship, where urban and rural youth will work together and make it accessible to them, where they can have access to the mechanization of uh, equipment of agriculture. They'll have access to the funding and other places. So I, I just to finish up, everybody is agriculture by the entrepreneur by default, I would say, because they want to survive, they want to feed their family. But at the same time, they're trying to figure out a way that's really different from where they are doing agriculture. And that's why we call them the agri-entrepreneurs. That's why we call them the sigma entrepreneurs. Because we believe that they're already doing something to create jobs for themselves as opposed to self wage employment where they're waiting for somebody to hire them. But in this case, they're creating jobs within the agricultural uh, value chain with the support of everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Pape. Mauro, please go ahead and ask your question. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I would like to um, build up especially to the reply of Pape and uh, Karen. As you, JD, point out very correctly, as a platform, we are trying to uh, introduce the concept of employment very heavily into our uh, uh, analysis and application for uh, the Agenda 2030. Some of us, we strongly believe that we can only with the food issue by itself. But we would, we should, um, uh, trying to define uh, our application our model for development, not only on food, but also considering the impact on environment and uh, employment. So I have just uh, some question to pose, um, trying uh, to to have some contribution from the three panelists, uh, because uh, number one, I think that would be very useful not only to analyze the reason of who stays and is successful in agriculture, but also the reason of who leaves. And not always is the contrary, because for example, when we speak about development or lifestyles, they have different impacts. So I would like really to ask uh, some uh, of their, uh, not generalization, but their uh, national or regional experience in this regard. So which are the major factors that contribute, not which may contribute, but contribute today for young people to stay and to be successful, but on the other hand, why uh, uh, others leave, beside of obviously the issue of uh, uh, supply and demand relationship. The other uh, issue that I would like to ask is where, uh, in what stages of the food system do you think there is more possibility of, su of successful engagement of uh, uh, young farmers, young entrepreneurs in agriculture? And the last question, how private entrepreneurship 
can be uh, realistically supported by strategy and public framework because as a donor is the one we are engaged in. Sorry to be long, but practically there are these three basic questions and they are uh, posed for the sake to help us to better define how we can put the issue of youth and employment into the broader uh, development framework. Thank you. Well, there's a few things here. So actually, as you, you've been asking this, some really good questions. Um, for the food system, I, you know, from my own point of view, from my own experience, you know, if you look at the supply chains of how the food gets from the farm to the table, there's a there's a lot there. You know, I am I'm coming from the perspective that there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's really like if you're focusing on, like for example, keeping the the youth, the young people, to staying and helping their own home, home homeland, like you know, in the rural areas, not like migrating to the to the city and do other works like what we're doing with um with with our grain. You know, it's not just like working as a farmer, but it's you know, like as a modern farmer of you know bringing in like learning the the technologies and applying um, and uh, to improve the whole system. So, uh, you know, it's actually what we, uh, we're trying to do right now to, to, to work with our network now is to try to engage more young people from that, from the local communities that, you know, their, their parents are departed with us, but also they are, you know, these young people are growing and they, um, and they can see the, the opportunities that they can stay, and and then we can bring them to work with um, to to train in like the the university of agriculture in the countries, or you know getting other kind of trainings. It's kind of like what puppies are doing, and then you know going back and you know help, work with us in helping the community. Yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your your question, but it's it's, it's is really broad, and and I do believe that there's the opportunities everywhere if you if you look at. Thank you. What you said, uh, I think for the first question for me, which is uh, who stays and who leaves, I think it's really connected to what stage of the food system can we create more jobs or can we impact more jobs. I think those two questions I would like to to link them because uh, I think who stays and who leaves is also a way of figuring out where in the food system, uh, what stage of the food system I think should we focus more on this one. Uh, first, who stays? I, in our experience, the youth, young people who stay and learn in agriculture are the ones who are mostly working in a different stage of a food system, which is not the production, but mostly the transportation the transformation, sorry, and the transportation and the access to the plant, access to the market. Those are the young people. We have a lot of young people who started uh, farming, but they realize that they, they, they produce at a really small scale. First, the cost of production is really high because of technology and equipment and all those things that we have, they have to acquire. acquire. And I think the risk also of getting to harvest is really challenging because sometimes security and all those things is really tough. So they ended up leaving that part of the food system to join the transformation food system, to join the transportation food system, where they will go with, go back to France where they used to work with our small farmers and ask them to sell them their harvest. And once they sell them their crop, they figure out a way to work through either technology or other partners or other team members in different regions or different countries where they will uh, commercialize the product and make more money. So it makes, for them, most of our young people, they feel like the middleman makes more money with less investment, less time. So that goes back to the second question is what, what, what says of the food system? You know, the commercialization and the transformation of the food system, either getting it to to the client or transforming the, the, the raw product into a, a byproduct or a different product, like transforming juice or syrup and all those things. I think that's something that a lot of young people are investing and in, putting it on different supermarkets, putting it on shelves, and also for giving it to uh, big companies or providing it to, to restaurants so on and so on. I think that's really uh, one of the states where we have a lot of people right now focusing because 
you know, you can do it with technology, you can do it with cleanness, you can do it with a lot of money, you can do it uh, in the urban city or the uh, urban part of the city or the rural part of the city. Now, to go back to your last question, which is how can private entrepreneurs should be supported by, by, by donors, I don't think I have a specific um, answer to that based on our experience, but I think there are a few options here that uh, can be explored. One, I think, is to work with a model that's already tested, Next, because entrepreneurship is not for everybody. You know, it requires a lot of things. Some people cannot work on their self, or they don't have the discipline, or they don't have the support, or sometimes it's really challenging. So that's why I'm saying work with models that are already tested, work with young people or organizations that already have developed models that are already tested, and see how can you invest on that. Because I think the main problem there, based on our experience, is access to capital. Access to capital, I think, that's the main. How can we bring in com- private sector companies, uh, microfinance institutions, companies that are working in the same industry, bringing donors that are working in the same industry, bringing as well uh, uh, research institutions that are working in the same industry, to help young entrepreneurs or uh, help young agri- entrepreneurs or small farm holders who are developing a specific product that either a new product or an improved product or a tested product to help them scale up that product in a way that you share the risk with other partners, but also you increase the likelihood of the young entrepreneur being successful by bringing all the partners who give them more support. I think for me, it's the Synergy, the partnership, but also making sure you invest on something that's really tested and give them access to other partners who can add value to what they're doing so they can scale up their enterprise, their businesses, and hire uh, more people that can not teach, but also provide them some, in- some revenue to be more financially sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Pate. We have another question coming in from MSA Finland, Mariana. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. So thank you for the presentation. And I would like to hear from you, the three presenters, how do you see the future looking in your countries? Who is going to stay in agriculture and in the rural areas? Is it that the boys are migrating to urban areas and the girls are staying in rural areas? and we have feminization of agriculture, or will it be like here in Finland, it's the boys who stay in the farms and the girls go into the towns? The thing about that is it's very a unique situation in the Caribbean. The problem is you have, um, at least in terms of at the tertiary level, um, you have a lot of persons who, you know, started doing an agri-related type of study before, you know, like, as a secondary choice. So they may have, you know, done agribusiness or some sort of agriculture science degree or something. And then, as you would find, as soon as they have finished their degree and they couldn't, they realized that they could not find any job opportunities. They didn't really migrate from urban to rural or rural to urban. They simply just left the sector. So you have all these persons with these degrees in agriculture-related fields, and they don't, they can't find a, a a relevant job. So they have gone on to do anything else. I'm talking people. I've known people that have left to do law, and have left to do you know business management, and and is ma- totally migrated the country. Um, totally left the country, and you know it's it's very it's sort of a sad situation because these are your the colleagues who came in with you in terms of pursuing an agriculture career. That's the kind of situation that exists. Yes, you would still have um, persons leaving the sector, leaving the, the rural area to, you know, find other work. Um, I would say it's it's more girls than boys. But even even at home, you would find those that remain, most of my boys that remain in rural area, they sit home and they do nothing, you know, because the agriculture isn't, doesn't appeal to them, and it's a difficult situation. So you, in that sense, you have two groups, two groups of young people, persons who are 
have a small interest in agriculture, but you know it just doesn't look as good as it could or as good as it should be. And then you have people who were interested in agriculture but are no longer interested at all. So then you don't have to find a way to bring them back to the sector because they are the ones with the high level of skill per se. So it's a very um, unique situation and this is kind of why the reason why Tech Fargo was started because of all of the media now, we, we originally started off as, as a blog to help young persons, you know, find that information for their entrepreneurial activities and to provide that moral support because imagine having to go through the situation where, you know, the, the sector doesn't seem to want you your skill can kind of be used in, a, in another field effectively because, you know, whoever is running that other field may feel as though, you know, oh, it's agriculture, so they have, it's it's not useful for them. In real, in reality, it, it, it quite possibly is, you know, you simply need to adapt. So it's a very um unique situation here in the Caribbean. Okay, thank you, Karen, and actually, thanks for for reminding us that because that is another topic that that uh, seems to come up. Youth are not homogenous; we can't treat them in one group. There, and you're telling us in the Caribbean, there are people who even go into agricultural studies. So clearly, there was an interest up to university level, but when they find that there's no opportunities, they even drop it to study something else after that. So. Um, yeah, thank you for that message. I now invite Pape or Trang. Uh, would you like to react to Mariana's question? What's the situation in your region or your country? Who is leaving? Who is staying? Sure. Well, actually, I, I, I think I get to share a lot with what Karen to say. Um, so in the rural areas right now, you see a lot of women or like all the girls are kind of staying. And the boys are leaving to the cities and, you know, find jobs. And, you know, it's, it's like just, just by looking at the network of farmers that we were working with now, 98% of them are women. So, you know, there's very few men who are wanting to do this kind of work. Um, but also, you know, if you, uh, but looking at our cultures at a sector in emerging economies like Vietnam, I would say that it, it's getting uh, more and more attention from uh, from 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 young people because because food is really something that coming up uh, quite pressing issues in countries like ours, you know, um, because we uh, we have a lot of um, problems with uh, with the weather due to climate change and and so there's a lot of uh, problem about the low quality kind of food. So you know, there's a there's m- like more people in the middle income category, and they now worry more about um, their food. So that turned into like the the kind of like more people are you know willing to to pay more for the food that they're going. That turned into a lot more young people are interested in this kind of um, business opportunities, like you know like I do, and also other young people as well. So it, I I would say that I'm I'm optimistic about it, but you know I I don't think that um it would be a major chance in just um in a, you know in a few years, but certainly like in uh, in ten um in in ten or fifteen years time. Um, so probably it, it would be. Um, I'm sure that it's going to be um, back. It's as a major economic pillar in the country. Okay, so thank you, Trang. So you're positive about the future of agriculture and young people in agriculture in Vietnam. However, the trend is that the women are staying. So indeed, there is a feminization of agriculture in the in the rural areas. Pate, would you like to respond as the last respondent to that question? Yeah, I think everybody said it. In most of our the countries that we work, uh, where we work, the tendency is that uh, uh, young boys are living first, and then young girls, the moms and the elders are staying at home. Okay, thank you, Pate. I think it has been a good discussion, at least a first discussion um, on the side of the platform, trying to bring together young people who are working on different levels through their innovation networks, through their um, 
their networks for, with technology, technology in agriculture, and also through their social agropreneur enterprises and uh, all around the world to share with us their experiences and also to give us all something to think about. Uh, this is all the time we have for today. And I want to quickly ask if anybody has something else to say. Uh, I might uniquely ask Mauro if he would want to come in once again, because he's a co-chair of the platform, he might have some parting words for all of you who've taken part today, taken the time to take part today. And I also want to make a special mention that the World Coco Foundation uh, joined us today. This is the first interaction with the platform, so um, thank you for joining us today. Mauro, can I kindly invite you to, to say some parting words on the side of the platform? First of all, I have to echo you, uh, thanking especially the panelists, but uh, also all the participants, because the interaction has been quite high, quite interesting. Let me take from some sentence that I heard for example, from Trang. It's true, the issue is very complex and uh, um, composite, but it's exactly your direct experience that for us is quite important to understand and appreciate more, because we want to understand really what is happening at the field level, at national level, at the regional level. I think also that is uh, quite clear uh, from Pape and Heron that there is a large scope, not only in production as uh, has been traditionally thought, but uh, uh, even more from processing, distribution, uh, um, and um, other stages of the food chain. And uh, something that some of us are insisting uh, not only on quantity, so merely production, but also on quality. Youth, the young generation, then they can really enhance a lot from what we heard uh, in the quality and uh, uh, the, the employment possibility associated with uh, such demand. Um, again, thank you very much, and uh, you know, we are sure there will be other occasion of exchange because we would like that your experience, your perspective, can feed us our broader framework also of uh, uh, the Agenda 2030.